Book 12, Sulla and Charybdis. We returned to Aea and burned the body of Elpinor. The next morning, Circe sent us on our way with the good provisions and a following breeze. She also warned me about the dangers that lay on our route, and I informed the crew of all but one. First, she told me, you will come near the island of the sirens, whose sweet song lures sailors to certain doom. You must plug your crew's ears with beeswax and tell them to row on without stopping. But if you alone wish to hear their song, tell your men to tie you firmly to the mast. If you cry out for release, they must only bind you tighter. After you pass the sirens, you will have to make a choice. You will come in sight of an unbroken line of jagged cliffs where the sea rages and boils on sharp rocks. Steer well clear of this, for no ship that approaches can avoid being wrecked. Even birds who try to pass that way are caught in downdrafts and perish in the spray. Pulling hard to clear those rocks, you will have to go between a steep, mist-shrouded mountain and headland. On the headland, you will see an olive tree growing, and below it, the sucking mouth called Cryptus. Three times each day, the sea is swallowed down into to this pit, and then vomited forth in a streaming geyser. If you go that way, your ship will surely be pulled down and broken to splinters. So stay close to the mountain, even though it too is home to a whore. Scylla, she is called, the six-headed monster who lives in a cave high up on that rocky cliff. Above the reach of the strongest bow shot, but her long neck can reach down all the way to the sea to snap up dolphins, seals, and fish who swim below. She'll snatch away six of your men, one in each mouth, but if you row hard, the rest of you will escape with your ship intact. Tell me, Cersei. How can I kill this Scylla and save my men? Surely she has a weakness. Stubborn old campaigner, put that idea out of your mind. She is too terrible by far. If you stop to fight, she will take six more. No, tell your men to row for their lives. That is your only chance. This I had not told the crew, for it would only make their knees shake, and there was nothing they could do. But I armed myself in hopes of defending my men from the enemy above. Crunch. Row! Row for your lives! After that, you will see the island of Thernatia where the sun god Helios keeps the divine cattle tended by two immortal nymphs. Remember Tiresias' words, steer clear of that island, and before long you'll make landfall in Ithaca. I remembered it well, and told the crew repeatedly, but when we came in sight of that sunny island with its green meadows and bubbling streams, my exhausted men clamored to land. They were mutinous, and I saw that fate had us by the leash. Before I would let them land, I made them swear that they would eat only the provisions Circe had given us and never touch Helios's cattle. Just as we beached our ship, a storm blew up. This cursed wind blew continuously by day and night for thirty days, trapping us on the island. As long as Circe's food and wine held out, the men were content but when at last it was gone, and starvation began to rack the bodies, all eyes turned towards those magnificent cattle. I reminded them of their oath, then went to climb the highest peak and asked the gods for help. I prayed to all the gods of Olympus, but their answer was to close my eyes with an accursed sleep, while down on the shore Eurylochus hatched a fateful plan. Comrades, hear me. All men feared death. But the worst death all of all is starvation. It is repugnant, painful, and slow. We should not die pitifully on this beach with these fat, majestic cattle so near at hand. We'll make sacrifices to the sun god, 
promise him a grand temple on Ithaca and ask his forgiveness. If he destroys us instead, at least we'll go down fighting. Oh, cruel gods! I returned to the ship, racking my brain for a way to set things right, but it was no use. I knew we were doomed, and soon fearful omens confirmed it. The hides began to crawl, and the meat on the spits to bellow like a herd of oxen. The wind turned, and we launched our ships once more onto a wine dark sea. No sooner was the island out of sight behind us than giant thunderheads began to mass overhead, and the sun was blotted out. In a moment, squalls hit us from the west so powerful that the mast snapped and crashed down in the stern, killing the helmsman instantly. Then, in the same breath, Zeus let loose his lightning bolt. I clung to a chunk of the keel, and when part of the mast flew by, I was able to pull it in and bind it fast. I rode this makeshift raft as the winds raged around me, and gradually they turned and drove me back on my course, back towards Scylla and Charybdis. For hours I clung to that trunk, unable to reach the firm ground or even get a good foothold while Charybdis gulped the ocean down. And then... I drifted for nine days before the gods cast me up on Ogygia, the island home of the nymph Calypso, Atlas' daughter. There I was stranded for seven long years. Calypso wanted to keep me there forever, make me immortal, but I wept every day for my home, and at least she set me free. I sailed my raft on the open sea for seventeen days before Poseidon wrecked me within sight of our ear's shore. Now your troubles are ended, my friend. We've kept you here long enough. The ship is ready. Come, princes. Let's go and stow noble Odysseus' goods beneath the benches. Pile up rugs so he may rest in the bow. You'll be home soon, King of Ithaca.